Well, hey, we are continuing our series, and uh, we've been doing a series on the Sermon on the Mount. It's been focused on what does it look like to be a kingdom people? Um, what is this thing that Jesus was inviting us into, this kingdom of God, and then what does it look like for us uh, to live to live in that kingdom and to live according to that kingdom rather than just the way that the world around us uh, works? And um, to kind of start my, my process, um, by the way, we're going to look at Matthew 5, 38 through 42, if you want to grab the Bible and, and get turning towards that. But to start off that process, I hopped on Facebook and decided to ask people uh, just their response to the um, to the scripture we're looking at. And it's, um, you've heard that it was said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And I, I kind of just really honestly said, my first response to that is, that sounds like a really good way to get beat up. <laughs> um, that it, it's it's pretty challenging to to think that that's actual um, advice. And uh, the Sermon on the Mount is perhaps the greatest speech ever given. And it's it's tempting on one level to go, well, maybe Jesus was just being uh, kind of an idealist. He was painting a utopia like John Lennon's. Imagine all the people living along perfectly, and and it. The distance between here and there feels so incredibly far. Um, or maybe, uh, like, my, one of my favorite speeches is Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. And in that, he paints this beautiful picture of a world where justice is flowing down like rivers and there's no more injustice. And, um, and yet Jesus uh, doesn't seem to be talking about a theoretical place. As a matter of fact, he ends the Sermon on the Mount with the words, um, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. Um, will build his house on a rock. The one who hears these words but doesn't actually put them into practice is building on sand, and their house can wash away. So, so Jesus is trying to get at how a way to really actually live. Um, and so, uh, we're going to attempt uh, to dig into this passage together and to consider it together and, and to see what it might have to say about this week. Um, it is a challenging one, though. To get us thinking, I want to tell uh, the story of the only fist fight that I've ever been in. Um, it was middle school, it was softball day, and we were all putting away our equipment, and um, I realized that I had a pretty good arm, so I could throw my mitt from where I was into the bin all the way over there, and so I tossed it. And at that exact moment, the guy with the biggest chip on his shoulder in our school walked right in front of that space, and time slowed down, and that mitt seemed to move ever so slowly <laughs> until it smacked him right on the side of the face. And um, he turned and immediately looked at me, and I was probably shocked and surprised, and immediately rushed at me. He punched me twice. I was on the ground, and that was the end of the fight. Um, <laughs> apparently, I wasn't built for that. <laughs> Maybe I should stick with preaching. But... Um, yeah, it, but I, I thought back to that moment as I was considering this turn the other cheek thing, because I turned the other cheek quite well in that situation. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking back to it, and from his, from his perspective, I was a guy who had just taken an object and thrown it at his face. From my perspective, he was a guy who jumped on me for absolutely no reason. We've both been wronged. Uh, and so how do we actually stop this process of being wronged and attacking one another. What, what could that possibly look like? We live, uh, we say we live according to the golden rule, which is to unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, I think we prefer to live under the rule of um, do unto others as they have done to you. And um, maybe take some extra steps to go beyond what they did so that they figure out that they should never do such things again. Um, that's more of our way. Uh, not to get mad, but to get evil. I think that's the way of the world. And so um, we look for what's fair. We look for eye for eye and tooth for tooth because that's fair. That's payback. And our first instinct when we take that mitt to the side of our face or that slight from a coworker, I think, is to go, well, I didn't deserve that. Now I'm going to figure out how to dish it back. So let me read this whole text for us. We're going to pray and then we're going to dig into it. You've heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, 
let him have your cloak as well. And if someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you. Don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, creating a kingdom, a kingdom of love, a kingdom of mercy, a kingdom of grace that we have sung about this morning and that we are here to worship you because of. Lord, teach us how to live that out in, in the down and dirty areas of our lives where we get hurt and mistreated and justice doesn't seem to flow like mighty rivers. We love you. Reality is, I think for most of us, uh, it's difficult to make it through a week without wronging someone or being wronged. Um, we're not quite there yet. But there will be a day, I think, when that will stop, but uh, it's not there yet. And it can be as slight and tiny as uh, going through the supermarket checkout line at the express lane and seeing the guy in front of us who has 20 items and seems to take forever, and we go, come on, man. Do you not see this line? Does he not know that I'm in a hurry? The driver who cuts us off in traffic, they're not thinking about our safety. This this was a dangerous situation they created. To, to more significant stuff, I mean, the stuff that we've all experienced in our lives that, that changed our world forever. Um, we never got to quite be where we are. Um, we start reading books about how to get past things mm. that we can never really get over. <laughs> <laughs> But in that moment when we experience hurt and injustice, I think it's incredibly natural. First instinct. How do we get payback? You see it, little kids, if I take that toy away from you, they want to figure out a way to either get that toy back or to punch the kid who took it. I mean, it's an incredibly natural, instinctive re reaction for us. And that's what Jesus starts this with. Um, you've heard it said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Um, it's a quote from three different places in the Old Testament. It's uh, Exodus 21, Leviticus 24, and Deuteronomy 19. Uh, it's the laying out of the law for these uh, group of uh, folks who were just slaves and now had become a nation. So what, what is it going to look like when they get injured or when they injure one another? Um, and it's the model of justice that's still in place today. And the idea of it was get the vengeance out of the personal hands. So it's not, I'm going to pay you back, like we think of eye for eye and tooth for tooth. It's, it was actually, um, if you've been wrong, take this to the courts, and this will be the measure of how the courts should measure it out. So if you smash into my car and you do $1,000 worth of damage, I'll go to take you to court, and the judge will sit there and say, well, I'm not going to give you $100, and I'm not going to give you $10,000. He needs to give you $1,000 to cover the repairs. That's, that's fair. Um, and in the context in which it had been written, it's an incredible thing because uh, we're talking about tribal warlords. We're talking about people who are intimidating each other. So if I steal one of your chickens, you would come and steal five of my chickens to make sure that I would never do that again. And if it escalated, um, there would be a war, and whoever was the strongest would figure out how to keep the belongings, and the one who was the weakest would figure out that they needed to back off. It was intimidation. And um, kind of like reminds me of Lord of the Flies, sort of. But then God inserts this law that says, no, we're going to have a justice system that's that's fair and where people aren't taking um, vengeance out on each other. Um, it was even, it was payback. But it was an incredible um, spot of mercy in the system that it was spoken into. For them to have heard that would have been like, wow, so now I can't retaliate. Um, which is, I think, where Jesus is beginning to take this. And it's not about retaliation, except Jesus takes it into an even harder place. He says, what if you did that in your personal lives? What does it like to not retaliate? And let me clarify something. Jesus is not advocating to simply stay in a situation where we are repeatedly getting beat up. He's not saying we should just give a license to folks who cause us injury and injustice again and again and again. It's not a call to pacifism or to cowardice. Instead, it's it's actually a stand that when exercise takes incredible personal strength. To not retaliate. To actually face the thing head on and to say, I am not going to pay you back. Um, but we need to make aware of what is happening. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to dig through these images, um, turning the other cheek, offering the cloak, going the extra mile, and then uh, we'll talk about why that might be better than the back, might be better than the instinct we have. The first image, turning the other cheek. Um, one of the things I love about Jesus is he's the kind of boss who doesn't ask you to do anything that he wouldn't do himself. And so if you look at John 18, uh, you see a story in which Jesus actually um, lives this out. He's being interrogated by a high priest, and uh, he says this, I have spoken openly in the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temples where all the Jews came together. I have not done anything in secret, and yet you question me. You ask, why don't you ask those who heard me? Surely they know what I said. And when Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby him slapped him in the face. And is this the way that you would answer the high priest, he demanded? And Jesus said this, if I've said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify to me what is wrong. But if I spoke truth, why did you distract me? And Jesus' Jesus's response, he um, is humble, he's meek. He doesn't say, you know, if you hit me again, there's not a chance that you're going to be in heaven. He doesn't uh, threaten the guy. He doesn't retaliate. He doesn't even stop him from doing it again. But what he does is with his head still held high, humbly and meekly, he exposes the situation for what it is. Look at what you just did. Um, another picture that folks would have identified with in Jesus' day of this was um, a Roman soldier. And um, they had a habit of kind of showing their power, and, and it would be like a, a, just backhanding something. It wasn't made to cause injury. It was it was a, a insult, a slight, um, to show who is in power. And my guess is when you go to work this week, when you're hanging out with uh, various people in your life this week, you're probably not getting punched in the face a lot. If you are, I would suggest leaving that situation. Um, but I think we've all kind of felt that backhand on occasion. You know, man, how did I just say that? How come that guy does that? He, he never gives me credit for what I've accomplished. Family fight. Somebody in the family who lives, who belittles us. Um, that's what Jesus is talking about. And he's challenging us not to let it slide. Not to just take it again and again. But to say, let's bring this thing to life. Do so humbly, meekly, kindly. To be better than our attackers, even. There comes a moment in the midst of a struggle where we have an option, and the cycle can keep going. We retaliate, they find another way to retaliate, and we keep going back and forth. But where we just stop it and we go, I need to bring to light what just happened. Um, that's why I was thinking about this. Passage, one of the crucial moments in the civil rights movement was March 7th, 1965. Made a movie about it called Selma. Um, it's a bridge. And a, a group of nonviolent civil rights demonstrators um, were walking the bridge, and TV caught uh, and exposed to the nation uh, this police attacking them viciously. And as I re uh, played that kind of scene in my mind, the word that a group of demonstrators throwing rocks at the police. Were they lashing out at the police? Were they going at them with their full power? Um, that injustice would have never been revealed. They would have just seen it as a fight between uh, folks who were fighting for equal rights and the police, and it would have been just injustice on both sides. Um, but the fact that they were nonviolently exposing the situation brought it to light, and the nation, as a result, had to figure out how to make changes. How do I repent? How do we not do this anymore and find a better way? I've experienced it in my family, in my relationships. There comes moments when Christina and I are fighting where one of us has to stop and go, what we just said really hurt, and we need to not do this anymore. And there comes a moment when we can stop because the retaliation doesn't start. Where we actually can say, with honesty and humility, okay, we need to find a better way. The question is, can we forgive as we've been forgiven? I love it. We, we roll off the Lord's Prayer every week. And it's good. It gets wired in us that way. 
Uh, but we just pray, Lord, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. That is a tall order for us to be able to take a hit and not pay it back. And when we do that, something changes. There becomes a new wide open space that God can actually bring a beautiful reconciliation out of. God can bring a beautiful way forward out of us. But it's not easy. It's not an easy question when you're taking a hit or when you're taking a slam on slander or whatnot when you feel hurt to actually forgive. What about this tunic and cloak business? Verse 40. Someone sues you and takes your tunic. Give them your cloak as well. Um, weird. Legal disagreement. I'm supposed to start stripping. I don't know. <laughs> weird, but um, as I did some research, I discovered in Jesus' day, especially among the poor, which is mostly what he was talking to, they were taxed incredibly by the Romans. Um, if someone was sued, I found out that the person who was um, being sued would have to give up their tunic as collateral for a future payment that might be required of them to make it fair. Um, so it was basically like giving your sweatshirt. As, uh, uh, give them your sweatshirt in, in lieu of uh, what might end up being exacted by the, by the courts. And um, You weren't allowed to take somebody's jacket, however, the cloak. It was warmer, it was heavier, it was more expensive, but people needed that in order to stay warm. It was used as a, a, a bed rest, uh, a bed roll as well to sleep on. And, and you couldn't take that from somebody as collateral. But Jesus says, you know what, if, if somebody sues you, um, He's so committed to resolving these things. And you'll give me your cloak as well. Go, no, no I'm, I'm not only going to give you my tunic as well. No, here, take my coat as well, because we need to settle this thing. <laughs> can't live without my cloak, so we're going we're to set this thing right. Um, it's amazing how long this stuff can drag out if you let it, and the cost of doing so. I grew up in a family where um, my dad and his brother had both bought a block in Mexico together. It's a little like vacation. And I can totally picture that happening and being like, this is going to be fantastic. We each go half in on this. We get the space all the time. Um, and then I also uh, learned from that never to do business within my family because my dad and his brother, um, at one point, his brother uh, needed money and my dad agreed to buy him out and felt he was being generous by doing so, but I'm sure he didn't pay him near what the property was worth. And um, they began to fight about what each of them was deserved. <clears throat> I don't deserve to have your stuff on my property more. I bought it from you. Well, I, I deserved a lot more money than that. You took advantage of my circumstance. And, and this led to fighting, and then it led to 10 years of not speaking to each other. And my dad died of cancer, and his brother was at his side. Um, and they had reconciled a couple of months before. But I think back and I go, man, he missed 10 years of his brother's life because of this thing. There was no amount of money that that was worth. Flip it on its head. Uh, what about this being wrong and, and saying, all right, we're just going to settle this thing? Um, Costco's return policy is phenomenal. <laughs> We bought a coffee maker from there. It was like one of these all-in-one gadgets where it like grinds the coffee and does the like mix it and all that. And, um, it was notorious because there was water happening and greasy beans and stuff that the grinder would just like grind to a halt and then it was done. Notorious for this. So eight months after ours broke, I was like, well, let's see how good Costco's return policy really is. And I rolled it in there. And I was like, didn't have a receipt. They looked it up in my history somewhere and were like, okay. Oh, we found it. I'm sure they can return it to Cleasing Art or whatever at that point and get their money back on it. But what they figured out was it's better for us to take a small loss and to keep the relationship. And now, as a result, we buy everything we possibly can. <laughs> We're looking at buying a mattress, and no joke, on the consumer reviews, in the pros column, you'll see Costco return policy. It's crazy. Um, <laughs> Amazon has done the same thing. Figured out it's better to take a small loss to, to 
settle this thing quickly and to keep the relationship intact. Because in the long run, they still win. And friends, in the long run, we still win. When we give a little in order to keep at peace with one another. It's so hard to do. Jesus isn't saying, um, let anybody take everything from you. He's not saying, uh, give them the shirt off their back. He is saying, find a way to stop it. Stop the retaliation. Stop the fight so that you can move forward. One more. Uh, someone compels you to go a mile. Instead, go with them too. Some of you may know this, but uh, this refers to um, a policy that was in place for Roman soldiers. They could commandeer you at any moment to walk with them up to a mile carrying a load of stuff. So they get tired of carrying their backpack. They could grab you and go, hey, you're coming with me for the next half hour. Well, I go up to a mile and you're going to carry my pack. Um, a good example of this is when Jesus got too weak to carry his cross. One of the things that a Roman soldier did was he grabbed a guy by the name of Simon and said, you get to carry the cross now until Jesus gets to the place where he's going to be crucified. Um, they could just come near you despite what you were in the middle of your, in your day. You could be working at your shop. Say, like, yeah, yeah, but what if somebody robs my shop? Or, I was walking with my kid. Uh, like, that wasn't part of the dialogue. They could do that. Now, imagine the impact on a Roman soldier as he grabs a guy and that person turns to him and says, you know what, I'm not going to go with you because you're making me. I'll go with you because I want to serve you. So how about instead of us just going one mile, I want to go with you too. I'll carry your stuff the extra mile. Wow, it's different. It's striking. When we come across it in our everyday life, when we run across somebody who... We're trying to get them to do something for us, and instead they go, no, let me do more. It's a picture of grace. God sort of breaks through in a moment. And something beautiful happens because we live in a kingdom, a place, not of what's owed. You and I, if we were exactly what was owed, we would not be here. We couldn't come here. We could come here with a burden of feeling hated by God, but we couldn't come here. Saying that we're loved by God. We've all sinned. And yet God says, No, I, I want you to be my children, and so I'm going to forgive you even though you owe me something. It's a beautiful thing. And we get opportunities every day to either be frustrated because people are asking something of us or we had to do something, or go above and beyond and show them a little bit about what the kingdom of God looks like. I can be mad on a Monday morning when I come in and the toilet wasn't flushed on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> or I can recognize that I've been forgiven so much that this is just a little thing. Um, I was thinking of Alice. Yeah. Sorry, Alice, I'm calling you on. Um, she was telling me the story about uh, some, she saw some lady wandering around in her neighborhood. And um, and she went outside and asked her where she was trying to get to and uh, found out and then went back inside. She didn't bring her wallet, which is smart, but she grabbed her license and then she gave her a ride. It's a little thing, right? But how much easier would it have been for her to just close her drapes and go, man, what is that person doing wandering around in her neighborhood? Little things. I saw a guy who wandered into church here and, and he went over to our little station where we do our snacks and there was napkins there and he was drying himself with the napkins. And I'm like, well, oh, you actually have a bathroom that you could use with some towels that might serve you better. They are only for two of them. But um, as I was talking to him, he was, he was walking because he didn't have enough money for a bus ride. He needed a dollar. And I happened to have a dollar. Then I thought about it and I'm like, Here's a dollar, it's around lunchtime. Here's another five dollars for lunch. Um, do you need to get anywhere? I have a car right there. You didn't take me up on the ride, but here's the crazy thing for that guy. It's a little moment of grace. I don't know if it impacted him. I don't know if he's going to become a Christian one day because he experienced a little bit of grace. But I think that's what Jesus was getting at, these little moments where we can dispense what God's kingdom looks like instead of what the world looks like. 
the phone, which is you only get what you're entitled to. Verses 42 and 43 talk about um, giving to one who asks and not turning away one who um, asks you to loan them something. And I don't think that it's a command that we're supposed to stop at every sign that we see on the freeway to hand that person money and to somehow go broke walking down the new district or um, downtown. Um, but it is a push for us to um, be wise but be generous and to not keep track anymore. And maybe that's the heart of this thing. For us to retaliate, we have to keep track of what somebody owes us, what we deserve. But something happens when we keep track. We stop living generously. We don't. We have a tight grip on the stuff that we're owed, and somehow this cup of generosity that God has <laughs> filled up for us and said, "I'm going to be generous with you," so I'm just going to fill this cup up with you. When we start living that way, all of a sudden we find that the cup is dry because we don't have any generosity to pour out because the other people owe us, and we go and we hold that cup out and say, "You fill this. You owe me." But when we remember how much we've been forgiven of, how much we're loved, and then we say, here's my cup, it's, it's overflowing, you can have some. Something in us changes when we live in this kingdom of grace instead of kingdom of equality and measured out justice. So to summarize, why this crazy life where we would turn the other cheek, why we would allow ourselves to lose in a fight. It stops the cycle of payback. John's talked about this again and again. There's these cycles in the world that repeat and repeat and repeat. That can wreck our lives, that can wreck our marriages, that can wreck our world. And something has to jump in and stop it. And what does is grace. This is grace. It reveals things for us they are, it brings light to it. So the injustice can stop. When we get offended at work when we feel we've been slighted and, and we let it go. But then we bring it up later at the right time with the right people and say, here's what's really happening. This is the effect. Everybody gets a chance to stop and decide a new way of being. The last thing is it stops us from falling into the pattern of the world. For us to live as kingdom people, it's not going to come naturally. We have the Holy Spirit in us helping us, but we're surrounded day in and day out. With a different way to do something, it doesn't look like the kingdom of God. And this reminds us of grace. It's radical living, it's hard, it's not going to come natural. It's the last thing we want to do is to do a favor for somebody that owes us, to do a favor for somebody who has slighted us and hurt us. But I think for me, it comes down to two questions. Who's am I? Am I God who loves by the other? So who am I to not live like that? And what do I want in my life? So if I want to be stingy, if I want to be bitter, if I want to be resentful, if I want to have tight fits, then I can live a different way. But if I want to be a person who can live generously and live out of a place of grace, it takes living that way to do it. It's a muscle of grace in our lives. And we receive it, and it doesn't change anything about our receiving it for us to not spend it, but we won't feel like it's a very valuable thing. The grace of God, we just, that's maybe what's in that prayer of forgive us our sins as we forgive others, that when we actually forgive and extend grace, um, all of a sudden we realize a little bit more of what God's done for us. And we begin to appreciate what God's done for us. But it has to flow through us, not stop with us. So friends this week, can we live in that kingdom? Can we be great people like good? Can we show generosity rather than stinginess? Injuries for kindness. I want to um, end with a quote from my friend. Uh, this came out of that Facebook dialogue. A friend of mine is a, a pastor in South Carolina by the name of Carmen. And she said this. Be kind when others are cool. Be generous when others are greedy. And if we can live so audaciously, we might even find our own freedom. That's a beautiful thing.
that's that's where we need to be. So let's try to do that. Let's pray. God, you surprise us. Your words are um, incredibly challenging to live out, and yet you invite us into something that looks nothing like the world around us, and it's so incredibly loving and beautiful. So Lord, help us to be conduits of it. Remind us in those moments when we're hurt, pause things for us long enough that we can stop and remember what you have done for us, and then extend that to others, Lord. We want to be transformed people who are transforming the world. And for that to happen, we need your help. God, thanks for your love. Amen.